Halito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. But first, a word from our sponsor. Potential is everywhere in the Choctaw people. It's in our schools and students. It's in our small businesses and entrepreneurs. Potential is in our lifestyle and health. It's in our culture and heritage. Passion and commitment is in our blood, ingenuity, and economy are a tradition. And the Chutla Foundation was founded for this potential. To cultivate minds and hearts, to stimulate ideas and passions, to extend lives and improve health through education, and to preserve and promote the power of our past. The Chutla Foundation Meeting the potential of the Choctaw people. This is going to be a great show today. And we're doing this in two parts, my friend Megan and I. So I hope you'll enjoy and be sure to listen to both parts one and two. You don't want to miss any of it. Enjoy and ya cookie. Many folks know about the removal of Native people from their homelands into Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, but typically they know it as the Trail of Tears. But what happened leading up to that removal and what happened on the so-called Trail of Tears once they arrived in their new home on their new lands and what was next? An entire population of people had to figure out how to start over. They had to build towns and start businesses and build a new government, all while fearing a constant push by non-natives and the government to continue taking over even more of what little land they had left. My guest today is someone I personally reached out to because of her extensive knowledge and expertise in this matter. Megan Baker is Choctaw and is a research assistant for the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma's Historic Preservation Department. And she's currently working on her PhD in anthropology at UCLA. Her master's is in American studies from UCLA, and she holds a bachelor of arts in ethnicity and race studies from Columbia University. Yeah, no big deal, just an Ivy League education for some super cool studies. Today, she shares with us a series she writes in the Itifa Busa, a column in our Choctaw Nation's Biskinic paper. This series is what caused me to reach out to her because I just had to let you listeners hear about her good work. Megan is also the host and producer of a virtual series called Chatta Tasholi about our Choctaw history and culture. She also researches and consults on government projects and other institutions. Halito, Megan, you overachiever you, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) I had a blast talking to you on the phone the other day. You're the kind of friend I want to have because I could talk to you all day long listening to all the extremely interesting things you study and the things you've learned. And I guess we did talk to it for a long time. Um, the other day, just geeking out over Choctaw history. (laughs) So (laughs) thanks for putting up with my 1 million questions. Okay. So before we get deep into this interesting discussion, let's learn a little bit more about you and your family. So you're from the suburbs of LA, but you have this strong connection to Oklahoma. Tell us more about that. So my dad grew up in Baptiste, Oklahoma, um, and he moved out to California the day that he turned 18. Um, And so that's kind of how I ended up out there. And we used to visit uh, Oklahoma every Christmas, every summer. It used to be like the trip that my dad and I would go on and it was like our bonding kind of moment. And so, yeah. I love that. You can't beat a summer in Oklahoma. I mean, it's hot, but it's always fun. You know, there's hay bells, there's fishing, there's shooting, you know, whatever you like. Um, There's no judgment out there. So (laughs) that sounds like a lot of fun. And right now you're living near your work. Share more about that. 
So I live in Calera, which is the town next to Durant, which is the headquarters for the Choctaw Nation. And I just live like five minutes away from the Choctaw Cultural Center working for historic preservation. Wow. So you just roll out of bed, hop in your car, drive five minutes, or maybe just roll all the way to the center. So easy. I had bought roller skates because I really wanted to um, <laughs> roller skate to work. But yes. if you've been to the cultural center, it's like a really winding kind of road. Oh. And the, you know, there's potholes all over Calera. <laughs> and so I realized it was not going to really work out. So, oh, yeah. darn. Well, if you ever do do that, will you please have someone video you roller skating to work? I mean, I, I feel like we should maybe do like a fundraiser or something for something <laughs> that we'll go, okay, we're going to watch Megan roller skate to work. Everybody put in a dollar, see what happens. I bet we'd get you a million dollars. <laughs> it would be pretty difficult. There's so many tiny little rocks. And if you roller skate, like little rocks will really send you flying. I don't so want to sound cruel, be... but that's what would kind of be fun <laughs> about it. <laughs> I know I could see my cousins loving that. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your Oklahoma cousins. <laughs> yes. Yes, I get it. Totally. Oh, wow. Well, again, I think you have the coolest job ever. And for your PhD from UCLA, you're working on a dissertation right now. So what's that entailing? A lot of reading and writing and looking at a lot of old documents. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, so I'm in anthropology. And so Uh, It kind of got started because I was really interested in studying economic development by Choctaw Nation Mm -hmm. because, you know, I grew up coming to Oklahoma every summer and for Christmas. And so it looks very different than how it looks now. And um, I thought that was so kind of interesting to see how much it had changed in such a short period of time. And so I kind of wanted to look about that. And so I study that alongside... um, a lot of the stories that I kind of grew up with about hearing people losing their land, losing their homes because of um, land restrictions and different kinds of things. And so I really wanted to know like, what was the kind of history behind the land restrictions? And so that got me into archival work, which is kind of not what I expected. Usually in anthropology, you just like go out and talk to people and you hang out and learn from them. <laughs> right. And so it's not really historically kind of based, but I went to the archives and I found a lot of stuff and I was like, wow, there is kind of so much history here that I've never kind of known very well. And so that's kind of how I got into that. And isn't it just like, it's a gold mine. Like you start, I call it digging for nuggets where you find one thing about a relative or about land. I don't know what it is, but you know, and you, and you, you find that. And it's like, you just want to share it with somebody. And most people are like, okay, so that was the plot that belonged to your uncle. Okay, fine. What, (laughs) why is that exciting? And you're like, no, you don't understand. I looked for 10 years for that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It was really cool to kind of like go through stuff and I would see all these names of people that I had like grown up knowing or like their parents or their cousins and they were just kind of all over these records that I was finding and it was just kind of really cool to see ourselves in history in that way you know I came across um, a petition that my grandmother had signed like uh, last year on my birthday, like came across her name in the archive. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was meant for that to happen. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. And you're right. Seeing our family names in history is, it's just so powerful. It, It makes you feel like, Oh, we belong to something, you know? So, well, I mean, you and I, you know, talking about the archives the other day, I'm so jealous because I also do a lot of research, amateur style, and I'd love to access what you have access to. And I asked you, you know, what is this mysterious, ever elusive thing called the archives? What does it look like? Because I've been to the Oklahoma Historical Society many times and to the National Archives in DC and the archives in Fort Worth, Texas. And usually we peons who can't go in the back have to stay in these designated on areas and use the computers to look up info, or we have to request certain documents that can be shown to us at certain times of day and all that. And, and there are times when I know there's records that the archives holds, but those records haven't been digitized yet. And I always picture if I could go back into the archives, like two big white doors would open and there's like this fog that comes out and this bright light with angels calling you into a, a million square foot 
warehouse of archives that has all these golden books and hold on the mystery and history of my family within them. And, and I just can't get back there because I'm a peon. Anyway, does, does the archives, does it look anything like that? I know I'm <laughs> exaggerating, but that's my dream. <laughs> Oh, uh, no, it's absolutely not that glamorous. Dang it. <laughs> it's just like bookshelves of old documents and folders and lots of boxes. It's mostly just boxes. Oh, I'll take it. I'll still boxes take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, it can take years to digitize all those millions and millions of records out there, but there's so much more that I should be grateful about that are digitized today than in previous years. So we're, we're getting there. Ben, you talked about how the Gilcrease Museum is working on a project for digitizing right now, right? Yeah, so the Gilcrease has the Peter Pitchlin collection, which is their largest manuscript collection. And so, fingers crossed, we might be able to help them digitize all of those records and documents and get there out there for people to see. Oh, that is awesome. Well, let's start. Actually, I just want to hear a little bit more about your family, starting with your daddy. Yeah, so he grew up in Baptiste. Um, he had, I think it's seven brothers and sisters. Wow. I know my mom and my dad have the same number of brothers and sisters. Whoa, so you have a we, lot of cousins then. I do. I have so many cousins. <laughs> and so he grew up, he's a Choctaw first language speaker. So he grew up speaking Choctaw his whole life wow. um, with his family. And yeah, he lived with my grandma and my grandpa. Um, my grandfather was a firefighter and my grandmother was a hairdresser. And so she would like do everyone's hair and people would come meet her. And so she's pretty involved um, with our church community, which is Bethel Hill. And so she'd like do kinds of like secretary work, I guess mm -hmm. you would call it um, for the church and all of that. And then she also worked at like the chicken plant yeah, as well. So a bunch Sounds of like hardworking woman. It's great. Definitely. Yeah. And I remember you telling me that she was kind of an intermediary between like the world of the non-natives and the native world. Right. Yeah. So back then it was like kind of pretty segregated. And so Choctaws really kind of kept to themselves. Um, they only usually dealt with white people, like if they went to school or the store, um, things like that. And so they kind of didn't really hang out together, but because mm -hmm. my grandmother was a hairdresser, she would have, she'd cut everyone's hair and do everyone's hair. And so that's kind of how she got to know different people. I love that. A bit of a liaison or a bridge. And, and then you have some preachers in your family too, right? Yes. So um, my grandmother is a Billy. And so she came, her home church is the Okachukma church. And my great grandfather was um, Simon Billy, and he was a preacher there. Wow. That's so cool. And there's a lot of Billies and there's a lot of bakers out there in the Choctaw nation. So if you're listening and you're a Billy or a baker, when I post this on my native Choctaw Facebook page, feel free to chime in and say, Hey, we're here. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot. Some of them I'm like, mm, I don't know if I'll say my cousin. is really my cousin. <laughs> I don't claim that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, even your, your sister works for the Choctaw Nation, right? Yeah, she's a graphic designer. So awesome. this is um, like her first job out of college and she did an internship and then she got a job offer like a few months after her internship ended. And so we live in the same apartment complex and it's pretty cool. Oh, I love that. Well, and then you, it's definitely a family thing for y'all at Choctaw Nation because you have um, one of your relatives even teaches Choctaw language there, correct? Yeah, um, a bunch of them do, <laughs> actually. Wow, mostly what? The, mostly the Billies, you know, um, like yeah. Terry Billy, uh, Tody Billy. They're both really, um, Miss Billy is the assistant director of the uh -huh. school, and Tody teaches the college classes. And so my Aunt Joyce, my cousin Elsie, um, they're like the high school distance teachers. Shout out to Joyce and Elsie. Hello there. <laughs> Oh, that's fun. I like that. And that's what I love about Choctaw Nation too, is they're great for finding talent and also letting you grow within the organization to say, you know, Hey, I think this would be a great idea. And I, I just, every person I talk to that works for Choctaw Nation loves their jobs. And, and that's so rare to have, you know, 10,000 employees or whatever they have. And every single one I've talked to loves their job. So 
All right. So you are Choctaw and then also Chinese as well, right? Yes. My mom um, grew up in Vietnam, but she is Chinese. Okay. And so you've got these two very, very different cultures. And does your brain sometimes go one way or the other, trying to study the Chinese culture and then trying to study the Choctaw culture? Um, I think I've always kind of, um, they've always been kind of really combined for me because, you know, like Cantonese was actually one of my first languages. Oh my Um, goodness. That's a hard one. (laughs) Uh, yeah. And so they were always kind of blended for me, you know, cause like my mom would come to Oklahoma. My mom actually, she's a seamstress and like she made all her clothes when she was growing up. And so she actually makes my Choctaw dresses that I have. Oh, you're um, so lucky. <laughs> yeah. She was like really interested in the culture, you know? And so like mm-hmm. we would go to the gatherings and someone would show how to make a dress. And so she's like, oh, I can do that after she kind of like was sat through a class. And so when well, I graduated, no, I think, oh, cause I went to this thing in DC. Um, it was like the tribal nations gathering, uh-huh. um, back when Obama was in, in president. And so I'd been invited to go to the, the youth gathering. Uh, so, yeah, my mom and I, <laughs> so my mom and I, um, worked on my dress together. Cause she's like, you have to wear your dress. And so we re- took on that project. And so I hand stitched the diamonds and she kind of made the body of the dress. Whoa, that's amazing. And I mean, my mom um, has made three so far, or she's working on mine right now. Um, that'll, that'll be my first dress um, and she's making it. But I mean, the diamonds, have you seen what your mom does to make the diamonds? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So we chose my first dress. I did the hand stitch diamonds. Um, um, I actually haven't even tacked all of them down yet. Like I didn't finish the dress before I, like I was sewing, um, the night before, like the first day of the conference. Oh my gosh. Really? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So like, they're kind of like tacked down. So like they'll stay, but you could definitely not put it through a washing machine because it's not all done. Um, but after that experience, (laughs) she's like, oh no, we are, we are sewing machine, those diamonds. (laughs) Well, I mean, how do your eyes not go cross? And for our listeners, like the diamond is a very popular Choctaw shape. Uh, it's on buildings, it's on their dresses and it, you know, represents the rattlesnake actually, but it's really intricate on the dresses. Like it's these little diamonds and you have to fold down each side and they're all connected. So you have to like iron them down and then you have to sew them onto the dress. It's not easy. So kudos to you. Kudos to your mama. That's amazing. So yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome that you did that. You'll have to, if you have pictures from when you went to that, um, tribal nations thing in DC, be sure to send them to me. (laughs) Okay. So, all right, well, let's get into this amazing series that I was so excited to get to meet the author of and really learn more and, and dig in even further than what I just read in the paper. Cause you have, I mean, it's probably gotta be hard with all the information that you gather to pare it down, um, into a once a month series. So tell us what inspired you to do this series. So I had done so much kind of archival research for my dissertation. Um, One of the lines of thought for me was like, I wanted to kind of track all of the ways that Choctaw Nation had lost land um, since 1830. Because, you know, basically all of the southern western Oklahoma belonged to Choctaw Nation. And it kind of went a little bit into um, Texas and a little bit into Arkansas. And so that all belonged to Choctaw Nation at one point. And then now we're kind of like really whittled down to like these tiny allotment plots and few, you know, hundred thousands of acres or not what it used to be. And so I really wanted to kind of track the ways, the laws, what laws had been passed to cause mm-hmm. that to them. To get whittled down and so because that's such a big kind of thing you know that that's that oh, been its right? own book yeah, you know totally. like just, <laughs> just that research was it, it's enough for a book like oh. without my you know other parts of my dissertation so I was like let me do that in addition to other things which was crazy right. you know totally <laughs> totally and where are you finding that information the archives right and then certain books or where are you getting all of that information typically 
Um, so you, usually you start out with the kind of all of the sources that talk about your very kind of topic. And so um, a lot of people go to kind of Angie DeBeau. Um, she wrote Rise and Fall of Choctaw Republic. And so that's kind of the quintessential Oklahoma kind of history. Mm -hmm. Clara Sue Kidwell also has the Choctaws in Oklahoma. Donna Ackers has Living in the Land of Death. And so there's all yes. these kinds of books. Um, and so you kind of have to read all of that stuff um, to get a sense of it. And so that gave me kinds of clues. And because they're historians, they um, cite their sources. And so they tell, it says kind of like what archives they went to, to find the information for their books. And so I looked kind of through their sources. And so a lot of them are at the Western History Collection. And so that's kind of where I started. So I knew I needed to go to the Western History Collection. Mm -hmm. And because I was so interested in laws, I focused on the work done by Choctaw lawyers. And so most people don't know this, but you know, Choctaws had a national attorney who kind of handled all of the legal issues that Choctaw had. Mm -hmm. And they would kind of um, write to Congress and they would kind of deal with the U.S. government and they would represent the tribe in different kinds of cases or kind of do whatever they needed. And I think you're right. I, th I think most people wouldn't know that. Yeah. And so um, I actually kind of found, so I, there's like um, a few who have collections at the Western History Collection. And so, and they're really big. They're really large oh. collections. <laughs> like the Patrick J. Hurley collection is one of the Western History Collection's largest collection. But he was also like, um, he was Secretary of State at one point, but he was a lawyer. He started out kind of his law career um, working for Choctaw Nation. He's like, I was born and reared in Choctaw Nation. And that experience kind of really shaped me fundamentally and taught me diplomacy. And so that was really like kind of the origin of his like long diplomatic career. And so that was, a, he's like a really cool person. And yeah. so he had some stuff in there that I kind of went through and looked through and all of that stuff. Your, your geek side just was soaking it in. You're like, give me the law. <laughs> this is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like it, but like when you're actually there and I'm like reading these case files, I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot do this. I cannot. This is so much. This is way too much. <laughs> but if you read like correspondence, when they write letters to each other, like um, chief to the lawyers or the lawyers to like um, a senator or something, those are a lot more interesting and a little bit juicier. Oh, <laughs> so okay. A little that more is where, Yeah. Yeah. And so you'll that kind of find so cool stuff though. there. I mean, to be honest with you, that stuff does interest me. I mean, take out some of the, some of the more finer points of the legal jargon, but the cases themselves to me are super interesting. So I get it. I read, I don't know if you've read this before, but it was, it's, um, there's two books, Choctaw before removal and then Choctaw after removal. But I believe it was the one that was both the before removal one that was just all the, um, treaties and agreements and all and the acts and things like that. And it was just, I was at first, just, I couldn't get enough. And then about halfway the, through the book, I was like, okay, I don't think I can stay that way for this so much. <laughs> yeah. You really have to commit to it. And so that's part of like where being in a academic program helps because like you have mm. to read the things yes. Yes. and you have to write about them. And so it kind of forces you um, yeah. to do something you might not otherwise want to do. <laughs> exactly. It, it makes you do it. You got to get that grade and you got to come out with that PhD. So exactly. <laughs> Well, and I think it's interesting too, that part of, um, I think part of the reason you started, as you mentioned the other day was there were these cool advancements in the 1860s and you called that the Choctaw golden age. And why is that? Um, so it's actually Curtis Billy. He's, he's like my go-to Choctaw historian because I love the way that he brings the Choctaw perspective mm. to history because he's read all of these like history books and these texts, but he knows that it's like wrong on some levels because it doesn't fully understand yeah. Choctaw culture. It doesn't fully understand our history or why we do things that we do. And so he had described this era as the Choctaw golden age because, you know, Choctaws had built a completely new government after removal and they started the largest school system west of the Mississippi. You know, they did all these incredible kinds of um, governmental things and had courts, all these things that people don't expect mm -hmm. for tribes to kind of have. And so it really kind of flourished 
then. Yeah. And it's like really amazing to have seen it flourish after like the most catastrophic and horrific event that could possibly happen to a people, you know, yeah. and still yeah. come out of it so strong and like have so much good in some ways out of it. I, I could swear that that personality, that um, strength that comes from them is still in our tribe today. I do feel like it has passed down. It's kind of a, a positive strength. It's like, oh yeah. So this terrible stuff is happening. Let's keep going. And I, I love our tribe for that, <laughs> that among many other reasons. So I, this is, this is great about your inspiration and why you started this series. And I just know there's gotta be a lot of people out there like me who read it. And we're just like, I have to talk to that girl. So the column that we're talking about, it's in, as I mentioned earlier, Iti Fabusa, and it's in the Biskinik, which is our Choctaw newspaper for, and for which you are currently writing. So the name Iti Fabusa has a special meaning. Would you explain that to us, what it means in Choctaw and overall? Yeah. So that's kind of the name of the leaning pole that comes from a story of how Choctaws kind of settled in their homelands where they are. Because, you know, mm -hmm. um, you have the story of Chikasha and Chuta, who are brothers, um, and they led two different groups of peoples. And so they were on a journey to find their new homeland. And so this sacred pole would stand upright whenever they had found their homeland. Um, and, you know, there's, there's lots of variations of this story. So mm -hmm. um, the way I tell it, you might not have, might not be the way that you know it, um, but that's okay. okay. I, I know, um, right. It's true. We can all have different versions because a lot of this stuff passed down by oral history. Yeah. And so, um, so they would put at the end of their journey every day they would kind of put the pole in the ground to see whether it leaned or it stood up straight and so at a certain point Chata was like oh it's standing up straight we're gonna stay here this is where we're gonna be mm -hmm. and then um Chikash, I was like no 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 it's still leaning so we're gonna we're gonna keep going and so they kind of split into those two different peoples and so that's why Chickasaws live kind of a little bit north of us in our homeland yeah yeah. And it seems like as our listeners will hear the Chickasaw and the Choctaw were intertwined quite a bit over the years, sometimes even when they didn't want to be. Uh, but today I think we consider them to be kind of our brothers and sisters. So it's representative of that where it's like, it's landed here. Here's where our Choctaw nation headquarters is now. And so I kind of took it that way. I can post that picture, a picture of that in our, uh, native Choctaw Facebook group. So is that correct? I assume it is. Yes. Yes. Very interesting. And so you've been writing an incredible monthly series in the paper that caught my eye from the very first article. In fact, my daughter is in her twenties and I made her sit down and read it with me. And we both were fascinated and couldn't wait for the next issue to come out. In fact, I was talking to her on the phone earlier. She lives in DC and I told her I was going to get to talk to you. And she was like, Oh, tell her I said, hello. So tell us the name of the series and the general idea of it. So the series is called A New to the Homeland, A History by the Decade. And so my kind of vision was that we would um, visit every decade since Choctaws had arrived in um, Indian territory in our new homeland and kind of follow the ways, just kind of really follow how we've developed our society in a new homeland, right? Because it was, removal yeah. was so horrific and tragic um, and there was a lot lost in that. But like yeah. at the same time, we still kind of really rebuilt because we have that kind of resilience to keep moving forward and yeah, so that's kind of what I wanted to kind of chronicle because, you know, I had read so many sources in doing my dissertation research and I was not going to use all of it in the dissertation I was realizing yeah. very quickly. Yeah, and so you didn't want it I, to go wasted, right? Exactly, exactly. And I had also found that a lot of people had not cited these kinds of sources. A lot of the records, you know, the books that exist, they rely on like federal records that are written from the perspective of the US government. And so it's a lot less the things that Choctaws themselves wrote. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to kind of bring that out because I think it gives a better understanding of what we kind of went through, what we were thinking at the time and what were the major issues that we were having. So yeah, that period from 1830 to the 2000s to today, there's so much happened. And I kept finding myself um, in all these different decades when I would read along going, wow, there's so much unrest in this decade. And then the next day it's like, oh, 
yeah, there's so much unrest in, in this decade. This is crazy. Um, and so, because each decade brought some new thing and the settlers just kept pushing and pushing to take over what little land the Choctaw had left, as I mentioned earlier. So very interesting stuff. And there, there are three things that I really loved about this series in the Biskinic. First off, there were pieces of our Choctaw history in there that I just didn't know. So it was exciting to get some new insights. And I also love that your goal was to shed light on some misconceptions that were out there. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, as you mentioned earlier, there was this perspective from non-natives who wrote down history. And so we're still today trying to pick apart, was it influenced by something? Was it influenced by religion or was it just the facts? And then we, we also do have records of Choctaws and some, you know, some of what they've written down, not nearly as much as the non-natives did, but trying to put all that together and figure out what the real history was, is, is such an interesting thing that you're having to deal with as a researcher. Native Chalk Talk has a wide array of listeners from Choctaws and natives from many different tribes to listeners across the globe to non-natives. And the level of knowledge about the story of what happened with the removal that many know as the Trail of Tears, it varies. It's like just the other day I met with a woman who had never even heard of the Trail of Tears. And I just like dropped my jaw. I didn't judge her for it, but it was like, oh my gosh, she doesn't know. And growing up in Oklahoma, I just assumed everyone knew at, at very least the general idea of the re removal, but it's not so. And then you even have some natives that know that there was a removal, but know literally nothing beyond that. And surprisingly, I'll have people from other countries who are obviously non-natives who know a great deal about the removal more than some of us. And that's what Na Native Chalk Talk is really all about. There's no judgment here. This is a way for all of us, including myself, to learn and to grow. So for those of you who don't know much about the removal, we will talk about that quite a bit today. And since this is a monthly series, we're going to talk about the highlights of each month since each month covers information about certain decades. So let's start our discussion in the very first issue of the series, which came out in January of 2021. And I got to read it from day one when it came out, I was, I was stuck on it. And this article was kind of an opener to set up what was going on during a time of great unrest. Colonizers had come in and settled in native lands and slowly but surely attempted to remedy what some called the Indian problem. So the government and settlers were pushing the tribes to give up more and more of their land. So first off, why don't you tell us where the Choctaw were originally living before the removal to Indian territory, which is now Oklahoma? So Choctaws lived in the Southeast and that's kind of the area that we now know as Mississippi, Alabama. There've been kinds of trends they've moved around kind of a lot in that but they still have a kind of like core um, homeland over there you know I've, I've actually interviewed Mississippi Choctaws before who say when you're there in the heart of Choctaw country there in Mississippi it's just normal for everyone to be speaking Choctaw and in Oklahoma even though we have Choctaw country there as well um, you don't just see people openly speaking Choctaw very often so and and if you find a first language speaker, like your dad is, that's a rarity. So we'll come back to what led to the removal of the Choctaws from their homelands into Indian territory. But for now, you mentioned in this first article that there were some misconceptions you wanted to clear up. So do tell. I think people don't know that much about kind of how different the five tribes kind of are and what that really means when it plays out in history. So the five tribes are kind of, they're, they're, they're called the five civilized tribes. That's kind of the name that was used at the time. And it was kind of to indicate that um, these natives um, had learned how to be kind of like the settlers and imitate their kind of society, had a similar, developed a similar kind of economy, um, which was a plantation style economy and had educated people and kind of all of that. And so they were supposed to be kind of um, a kind of standard that they're like, oh, look at these Indians. They're not all dumb, you know, <laughs> like they could right. be civilized as well. And so these are people that you should kind of copy to other tribes, right? Mm -hmm. um, to kind of like, pit them against one another. I yeah. Think. Don't in, you want to be like the Choctaws? They moved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, but you know, Choctaws did those kinds of things as a response to um, settlers coming in and trying to take their lands and um, being kind of denigrated um, 
they were like, no, we are very knowledgeable people and we can kind of show this. Look, we have learned English. We have learned your laws. We have learned yes. the ways that you have done stuff and we can do it kind of similar. So you can kind of recognize that we are a government. And so that was like a kind of strategy that Choctaws took on throughout their kinds of constant engagements um, with Europeans. You know, they dealt with the French, they have dealt with the um, English and they've dealt with kind of Americans. And so mm-hmm. that was kind of a response that they had. Wow. That's so interesting. And again, that that's definitely a misconception. Like at one point I found out that my uh, relatives, when it, you know, they, once they had their land allotments that a lot of them were called in the newspapers, prominent Choctaws, the Coley's are prominent Choctaws who yada, yada. And one of them even had a Tiffany lamp in her her room. And I was like, whoa, that's totally different than what I always pictured. You know, I, I definitely pictured. Um, and it is true that most of them did not speak any English, but I definitely did not assume that they'd have these big farms and all these horses and, and they had um, not slaves, but they did have servants and that kind of thing. So very interesting. And the part about education, I think is is a very, in fact, later on, I have a question for you about Chief Jones, uh, because it, it did seem like the Choctaws had a better scenario than a lot of the other natives when it came to say boarding schools or because they wanted to educate their own. It wasn't like, it wasn't necessarily always the white man coming in and forcing education on them. And it was all these, you know, um, mean nuns or whatever it was. They, it was more their own community, um, with people who did had learned English within the tribe that, that were teaching other, uh, Choctaw young people, not in every case, but I think that's another misconception that, that I love to clear up as well. So as you mentioned, a lot of people don't know some of these details, even Choctaws, it's important for both natives and non-native non-natives to know about indigenous history, because we did have an effect on our society. So one of the other things for me that I want to kind of show is like a lot of the scholarship talks about kind of things happening to Choctaws, like they were passive, like they just let these things, all these bad things kind of happen to them. But what I really wanted to show was like how agentive and how much that Choctaws did to contribute to history, right? Like Mm. they actively made these decisions um, to change their society so they could um, better deal with settler society. You know, Mashula Toby was the one who was like, oh, this education is really important. They need to learn English so they can, you know, deal Mm -hmm. with these settlers who kind of come in. And so when the missionaries um, wanted to come to Choctaw territory, he's like, you guys can come, but only on the condition is like, you don't teach your religion. You can Mm -hmm. only teach like English and math and all of these things. That is the only way we will allow you to come into our lands. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a very clear decision that he had kind of made to bring that knowledge into our community so we could benefit from it and kind of blend it um, into our own society for like the betterment of our people so smart. And it was part of them trying to figure out how to survive because they knew this was not going backwards. They were never going to get back to the way that they had lived in that freedom and that nobody owns the land and all that, which is really sad. But at the same time, I have to commend them. They really were looking ahead and trying to protect their people. And education was one of those things. I think we can all learn from that. It's never bad to educate yourself, right? (laughs) Yes, definitely. That, that's such a good point. I like that. So in the series, we learn a lot about Choctaw government, economy, and land, and how the U.S. handled the Choctaw and the treaties. And you mentioned that the Choctaw being a sovereign nation is important. Tell us why that's important to keep in mind. It kind of goes back to what I had just said in that like people thought they were kind of passive agents, like things just happened to them. But um Being sovereign is a reminder that we are a nation, we've always been a nation, and we always will be a nation. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the United States needs to kind of recognize that and other people will need to recognize that and like respect our sovereignty and the way that we're trying to help not only Choctaw people, but other people who live in the same area as us, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Choctaw Nation has done a lot 
over this pandemic to help people in a way that the state and federal governments can't do. But we, because we're sovereign, we've been able to do things to better protect our people, have better kinds of protections for people through a pandemic and providing for people. And so I think that's really kind of important because especially now in this political climate where the governor is kind of really anti-tribes, people need to know that like we're we're we got we're gonna do what we're gonna do for what's best for our people and our history and all of that. So the Choctaws were not included in the night in the 1887 Dawes Act that allotted Choctaws their land from the government. So the Dawes Act is something for our listeners to understand because we'll talk about it a lot in here. In a nutshell, the result of the Dawes Act was individuals from the tribes were each allotted land in Indian Territory. So um, go ahead and and share a little bit more, though, about when the Choctaw allotment began and how the Curtis Act was part of that. Yeah. So the Choctaws were the first um, of the five tribes to be removed. And so it was kind of an experiment for the U.S. government. They were trying to figure out different ways of acquiring native land. And so removal was a, a, an experiment for them. And so mm-hmm. the Choctaws were the first to kind of go through that in a large scale kind of way. When you compare the treaties of the five tribes, the Choctaws are comparatively much stronger in what they're able to kind of secure um, from the U.S. government. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the most significant is that, you know, Choctaw Nation, the land that they are going to be removed to, they own it in fee simple, which is like the clearest kind of land title that you can possibly have. There's absolutely Mm -hmm. no way you can kind of contest it. It's a very clear ownership. And so Choctaw Nation owned it collectively. So it meant all the people owned that land. And so um, you had to have the whole government kind of on the same page if you were going to do something kind of to it. Mm -hmm. And so that is the really strong kind of tenant of it. And so the other five tribes secure similar kinds of terms, but I don't think as strongly as kind of the Choctaws do. Mm -hmm. And so um, when it comes time for allotment, the U.S. government is kind of looking at all these treaties and, you know, the leaders in the five tribes are like, no, we do not want to allot our lands. We don't want to do that because we we like the way that we've managed our lands now, which is that everyone kind of collectively owns land. So they're kind of excluded when they make that legislation. So they're like, oh, these treaties yeah. are so kind of different. <laughs> and so it's like too much of a headache to deal with right now. So like their plan was that they would um, take care of allotment for the five tribes later. Um, but okay, everyone else's yeah. lands got allotted. And I didn't even know that. I knew it's weird. I've always known the Curtis Act and, and the Dawes roles and all that. But for some reason, I hadn't put it two and two together that they actually didn't get their lands till a little bit later with the Curtis Act. So, um, and then Choctaws, you mentioned in the article that the Choctaws who took land allotments were also granted U.S. citizenship in 1901, before Oklahoma statehood and long before the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act, which gave the majority of American Indians citizenship. So that's, that's another misconception. I mean, it, uh, it's easier to say, oh, you know, Native Americans weren't granted citizenship until after 1924, which is in itself just, that's nuts. But still the the Choctaws were different, right? Yeah, and that, that kind of really goes back to when what I wanted to change the misconceptions because there's a lot of really broad um, Native American history that mm-hmm. a lot of people kind of know and they kind of really assume every tribe yes. um, is the same <laughs> in that kind of regard. And so, um, you know, from me studying the law, um, and like Choctaw history, I was like, but we're so different. That actually didn't apply to us. And I would see kind of people talking, um, saying stuff that, oh, this happened to Choctaws at this time period. And I was like, wait, no, that's not actually kind of historically correct. And so I really wanted to kind of set the record straight for people to be like, this is what happened at these kinds of times. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit different and it, and it just kind of makes things a we can start to see the complexity of, you know, this history. Um, and I think that's always what we need more specificity and understanding the kind of complexity. So we don't get treated like a monolith, you know, Mm -hmm. um, all of our histories are not interchangeable and they're not all the same, you know, we're all (laughs) sovereign nations and we have 
decided things differently than other tribes. And so, yes, um, yes. you know, even like Mississippi and um, Oklahoma shop goes so kind of different. Yes. Um, not necessarily <laughs> on the same page about everything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to kind of bring that out and help people see that. And that's, that's such a good thing you're giving to the world, to people who really want to understand this stuff. And it's hard to find the information and it's hard to break it down into what does all this mean? And I mean, I, we, we have a message for Hollywood. Not every native wears a headdress, not every tribe had headdresses, not every, um, uh, or war bonnets and not every tribe lived in teepees. So, um, yeah, we get, there's a lot of mixed misconceptions there. It's, it's just like saying a New Yorker speaks the same way that, um, a person from Mississippi speaks very different, very different cultures, like two different worlds. So, okay. So you mentioned the five civilized tribes. And again, because some people may not even know which tribes are included in that bucket, there's the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Seminole, and Creek. And, and it's very important, like you said, that there's a benefit there that they have these stronger treaties. So just reiterate, reiterating that. Um, so why is the information we read in this series, a different perspective than one might find on the internet or in history books. And, and part of what I'm getting to is I think you actually went to some of the Choctaw elders, right. To learn information. Um, so I was, I really wanted to write this history because I wanted to bring that kind of Choctaw perspective back into it. You know, I learned so much from Tody Billy as a historian and it was so important for him to kind of be like, this is why we kind of did these things. And I would read non-native scholars kind of trying to speculate about why Choctaws did what they did. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd be like, no, that's absolutely wrong. If you knew a Choctaw person, you know, we wouldn't care about that kind of thing. Or it's like, <laughs> oh no, it's actually about this kind of thing. So you're kind of wrong, but they were the person with the published book, um, right. you know, and that, right. that would, would win awards by historical associations. And I'd be like, no, like <laughs> shaking my fist, oh, uh, being like, no, know? that's incorrect. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of bring that to the series. And I, it was important to me that I sourced the history um, from sources that I didn't see cited, but existed in the kind of archival record. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to use those kinds of sources because they, I thought they gave a much better sense of what was going on at that time. For sure. And I mean, along those same lines, you mentioned in the series that there are still a lot of stories in history that are written in Choctaw, right? The Choctaw language. Yeah. And so that, that's been like my favorite kind of part of this. Um, yes. I was recently working with um, Terry Billy um, to kind of translate some of these documents that I had in Choctaw. Um, you know, they were from like around 1900s and they were talking about allotment and what was about to happen with that. Or it's like, and so they kind of really give you a sense of like, what's going on in people's lives. They're like, I can't put food on the table. Like they had so many different kinds of problems and issues and they'd be like letters written to like Chief Green McCurtain. And mm. so they'd be like mm -hmm. asking for his help or asking for kind of advice. And it gives a much richer sense of what it was like for people back then and what kind of things that people were going through. And so I kind of really wanted to bring that to the table um, and make it kind of accessible for people as well. Oh, I, I would just be drooling over that. The idea of here's the actual Choctaw language getting translated so that we can understand it you know, straight from their pen. So that that's really interesting. A lot of tribes don't have these kind of records and, you know, it, and I, I think it goes back to the way that Choctaws took education on, took it really seriously very early on. And so they learned English and then they got the language into a written form. And so, you know, a lot of the Choctaw documents are in Choctaw language. <laughs> and, you know, and, and this is in like the mid um, 1800s and that's pretty, pretty rare. And then we, there's so many records that kind of exist in this way. And, you know, I knew those, um, historians, those non-Choctaw historians weren't citing these sources because they couldn't even translate it or like know what was they were saying. And so I knew there was so many stories not being kind of told yes. but that kind of existed elsewhere. And so um, I really wanted to bring that out. Yeah. You're like, I know it's out there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Oh, I would love to see what those look like someday. Um, when you're looking through them, are you touching them with your bare hands and, or are you looking at copies? Um, it's when I, when I go to the archive, it's usually the original documents, but you know, the Western history collection has digitized a lot of Choctaw records. And so sometimes I will look at the PDFs online. Um, but most of the time, um, it's the originals, but then I also like photograph them mm -hmm. so I can look at them later. Yes. So zoom in, it's like, try to figure out yeah. what one word is saying. <laughs> exactly. Cause you know, when you're doing, when I was doing my archival research, I only had a certain amount of time. Like you can only be there at a, from like nine to four. Okay. So but it like kind of cram everything in. And so and you have to I, know what you're looking for before you go in. Right. Exactly. And so like, I would just like take pictures of stuff and I was like, oh, I'll read this like more in depth later. Like yes. I, can't, I know it's important, <laughs> but I can't spend the time to read right. it all right now. <laughs> go, so go, I, go. yeah. So now I like, like my, I had to like upgrade my iCloud so much because I have so many photos of archival documents and like right. my phone. That's all I have mostly. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> we should compare phones sometime because I have a lot of that going on. In my phone too. <laughs> yeah, that's too funny. We're such geeks. So <laughs> yeah, it's really nerdy. You took yours to the next level though, with this PhD thing. I think you may have beat me on that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's interesting too, because the national archives in DC, the first time I went there, they brought out what I had asked for. So I like gave them what I was needing and they brought out the original books and documents and they didn't give me white gloves, which I was expecting them to do. And they were like, no, you just, it's better to touch it now as we've figured out with your bare skin than it is with the white gloves. So I was sitting there going, Oh, I'm touching this. And my husband was like, I don't know why that's so important. I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's so crazy. And there's so many old records, um, that exist that don't exist for other tribes. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is so crazy. Like you could write so many books, um, you know, right. like people will write whole books about like this one battle in this obscure kind of war. Yeah. Um, just that one little piece of history. Yeah. And then like no one turns the same kind of respect, I think, to like Choctaw events in history. Like, why don't you look at it with a microscope in the same kind of way? And so I, I really feel that kind of imbalance. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to kind of rectify that in a, in a, in a small way. Cause there's no way that I could possibly do that with this series because it's far too True. much detail, <laughs> um, but I, it, I'm trying to get enough out there to pique people's interest that I mm -hmm. hope that they're like, Oh, this is really cool. I want to study this. And I want it to kind of inspire a new generation of, um, Choctaw scholars who are like, I, I want to study this particular kind of thing. And they can, if anyone ever wants, just send me an email. I'll be like, yes, here are the records for this. I think that's a great project. Like that's always what I'm trying to do. Yes. So, Hey, everybody, if you want to be part of what Megan just said, you just reach out to me and I'll give you her email address. I love that. Well, I mean, okay. Side note, I've always said that about, I know, I know this is, this could be a little sensitive, but movies and the trail of tears. Like there's all these movies about the Holocaust that really, when you watch it, it's, it's hard to watch and you cry during it and all that, but it helps you feel more and empathize more with what was going on with the Jews and the Holocaust. But when it comes to the trail of tears, I don't know of a single movie that was made about the trail of tears, much less can someone kind of, if someone did that, can you please do it well, because you do it wrong. And man, you're going to have a lot of mad people on your hands, but sometimes I, I want it to come alive. I want to understand what the terrain looked like where they were walking. And yeah, I've looked some of it up and someday I will do the trail of tears walk, but, um, it doesn't always come to life alive to me. And there's all these stories from the trail of tears. If you think about the amount of natives that came over during the removal, each one of them had their own story, you know, maybe did they bring their dog? Did they have enough warm clothing? Cause they had to do this during the winter. And, you know, there's just so many stories that could be wrapped up in there. And no one has ever tried to touch that. Maybe there's a reason for that, but anyway, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think movies are really great in kind of humanizing the American Indian kind of experience. And that's what we want to see. You know, when I watched Rutherford Falls, um, 
I was like, oh my gosh, I always think that's exactly my job. Like <laughs> whatever <laughs> Reagan does, that is my life. And you know, and then I watch Res Dogs, which is based in Oklahoma. Uh-huh. And they Love have such it. Oklahoma kind of like references and yes. experiences. And it was like, whoa, 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 that's too real. I don't want, I actually didn't want to see that. <laughs> like I, that, that makes me cringe when I have to watch what happened to right. me, happen to someone on screen. <laughs> It's so but true, like, <laughs> I think it's really important that um, people, you know, American Indians have been dehumanized for so long mm-hmm. by anthropology, by history, and movies can kind of give us back that human dimension to know that we went through these kinds of experiences. Um, yeah, and we still, you know, move forward with um, our lives and like learn from it and like always kind of remember it. And so, yes. I think it's good for that. It's like, never forget it, but use it as, as strength to move on. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. I'm glad someone shares my thoughts about that, but (laughs) (laughs) so you end January's edition by talking about the resilience of our Choctaw people as you just did now. And I couldn't agree more. So let's head on into your February article where we start getting into the meat of the history. You titled this as a new Chetta homeland, a history of the decade, 1830 to 1840, which covers the early period of the removal and the adjustment to the, the new homeland and in Indian territory and the formation of the Choctaw nation, even as settlers continued to push their way into their Indian land. What some folks don't know is that the Choctaw were the very first of the five tribes to be moved to Indian territory. I think a lot of people think of the Cherokee as being first. Um, I was recently at a well-known National American Indian Museum and there was a section of the museum and there was a sign on the wall and I read the sign and it said, what was the trail of tears? The trail of tears was when the Cherokee were removed from their homeland to Oklahoma. And I don't know what the reasoning was that the other tribes were left out of the information, but this is my uh, addition to this wanting to clear up that misconception as well. So all five of the so-called civilized tribes mentioned earlier were moved along with other tribes. And the reason that's important is because all five tribes went through a horrid ordeal. Now the Cherokees did travel the farthest I believe something like 2000 plus miles. I I can't even imagine, but let's, let's remember that they, there were a lot of tribes that came over. So let's hear about the removal and what life was like after landing in their new land. Uh, So actually um, it's a Choctaw chief who kind of coins the term um, trails of tear and tears and death, you know, like mm-hmm. the Choctaws had were going over and um, a newspaper journalist had come was like, oh, all these people are coming through. I'm going to go interview them. And so one of the chiefs had described it in that kind of way. And it was kind of published in that way. And that kind of popularizes the term once other people kind of start coming over. Um, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very rooted mm-hmm. in a Choctaw kind of experience. Um, and so when they came the first, there was multiple waves of Choctaw removal. Um, and so the first one came in like the winter the coldest kind of time and they came to a place that none of them really kind of knew you know they had sent out survey um they had surveyed kind of the land and like looked at it what it was kind of kind of going to be like Mm -hmm. um but they didn't really kind of understand it and so they had to completely start from scratch basically um and so people were building houses or trying to like find shelters for themselves and so it was really really difficult um and so um, the later tribes would obviously learn from the Choctaw kind of experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Chickasaws are the last to kind of come over. And so um, they, they learn from the Choctaws, the Cherokees, the Creeks, and they're like, oh, what's the best way to kind of do this? And so they actually like um, are able to bring a lot more kind of people. But, you know, for Choctaws, it was a real like ragtag kind of experience. Like oh no my one, gosh, right? you know, was really doing and so it was really difficult a lot of people kind of died um and so you had to deal with that kind of devastation but you know they eventually kind of created their kinds of settlements um and so and then started their kinds of societies you know they would um 
go around kind of Scullyville where they would get rations from the US government for food. And so, and then there was also Dokesville, which is towards the South. Um, and so those become popular kinds of areas, but then people will kind of keep moving on hmm. wherever they kind of thought would be good for them. Yeah. And so then you start to have a kind of government, like the, the government kind of gets started and they're kind of organizing things. And so that kind of really happens in those early years and they really kind of get things going. And so eventually kind of Choctaws are like, okay, people have places to live, everything's kind of handled. And so then they kind of start growing um, their government to make sure people had all the things that they needed, which is like the role that what a government is supposed to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. According I mean, to they, Choctaw values. They could have gotten there kind of dispersed, fought amongst themselves. It was a traumatic thing they just went through. And yet they got there, they got on their feet and they made it work. And it really must have been such a rough time for the chiefs and leaders of the tribes. They knew they were done with life as they knew it. They weren't big enough as a tribe to take down the U S government. And to try at this point would certainly mean death for their entire tribal population to, to resist the removal. So surrender for lack of a better word, I I hate to use that word, but but giving in to some degree was inevitable, but the Choctaw were intelligent and they at least tried to negotiate whatever they could. They're like, this is happening. Let's keep negotiating. And so the most detrimental treaty for the Choctaw was signed on September 27th, 1830, the 1830 treaty of dancing rabbit Creek. That is the one that like, if you're taking, if you've got takeaways from today, that, that was kind of that game changer treaty, um, that said, all right, we're, getting out of our homelands in Mississippi and and the other surrounding states. And we're heading on over to Indian territory to start a new life. So can you tell us some um, about some of the notable points of this treaty? Yeah. So one of the significant ones is the fee simple kind of part, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they owned the land collectively. And so that was pretty novel um, at the time. And so, um, that gave them a lot of control and allowed them, them to prevent Congress from doing too much kind of damage. Mm-hmm. I think Congress really learns from this experience being like, oh, it's actually a bad idea if we want to get Indian land to do it in fee simple. So we'll, we'll try something else when they negotiate other kinds of treaties. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, but we were lucky in that we had negotiated that term um, pretty early on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as you mentioned before, it's a critical decision that continues to support Choctaw sovereignty today. So again, we're, we're re- reiterating the importance of this. Um, so that had to have been a hard idea to swallow for our ancestors, where once land belonged to everyone in the tribe. Now each person would receive their own land. And as much as you and I would feel that's a good thing, hey, land, that type of culture was unknown to them. They had community and now everything would change. It's like, oh, we each, you know, have our own little plot here. So the Choctaws, they know it's inevitable. It's time to leave their ancestral homes and all that they knew to start off on a journey to their new homelands. But this didn't come in one single removal, right? Yeah. So, you know, actually when um, they were being removed there in the, within the treaty, it said that, um, up to like one fourth of people would be allowed to stay behind. But if they stayed behind, they would have to live under Mississippi law. Um, They couldn't be kind of seen as Choctaw anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of had to assimilate into society. So actually a lot of Choctaws stayed behind in Mississippi. And so not everyone kind of went over. There are stories of Mississippi Choctaws later going to Oklahoma, trying it out for a little while, not liking it and going back to Mississippi. Um, And so- they probably saw that red dirt and were like, no, we're not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So people came in different kinds of waves. Um, so you have 1832 to 1834, 1838, and then some from 1844 to 1855. And so these were the ones kind of sponsored by the government, which was a negotiated treaty point that they would kind of help with that removal process. And so those were kind of the really official ones. And of course, Mm -hmm. you had the first one in October 1831. Um, Well, and do you find that that's a misconception too, that people think, oh, there was this day 
and they left and then they eventually got to Indian territory and that was it. I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of us didn't know at some point that there were several removals throughout the years. Yeah. So they, they, people had to be, you know, convinced to leave because this had never happened to anyone really kind of before and they were the first tribe to do it. And so it was really hard to just kind of pick up everything and do this thing. Whereas, you know, other tribes, like they were able to take their entire societies, like organize and pack up and bring everyone over. Um, but that wasn't the case for the Choctaws because it was such a kind of new experience and no other really tribes had kind of done it before and no one to kind of learn from. But I think the other five tribes really learned from the Choctaw experience. In that regard. For sure. It's like they say on the movie Moneyball, the first one through the door is the one that gets hurt the most. And the Choctaw definitely uh, were pretty beat up and battered through this whole experience. Um, now, I know that the people that stayed behind in Mississippi they really, they suffered for staying, didn't they? Yeah, Mississippi did not want them there. <laughs> um, <laughs> they really wanted them kind of really out. And so they made life really difficult for them. And there are stories of Choctaws like hiding in kind of the swamps or like the less populated kinds Aww. of areas because they really wanted to avoid the white people who would make their lives really difficult. Yeah, I read a book. I feel like it's that same book about the Choctaw after removal or something where they were, they went back to Mississippi in the book and were talking about what those, those people went through. It was, it was horrible. I mean, they, there was starvation. There were people living just on the road. It was very, very sad. And I can't imagine being a settler in that area and coming and going, okay, we're taking over this Indian land and then seeing what is left behind of that, the devastation of, I took over their land and now they're starving to death. So, um, it's, it's probably even worse than we probably can imagine, I would assume. So for those who were heading over to Indian territory, the government did not provide adequate supplies and they were uncoordinated in their planning. As you mentioned, it was the first one. So, and they got started later than they intended to, right? So that they were smack dab in the middle of winter when they started walking. Yeah. So pretty disorganized you know I, as I mentioned before removal was an experiment this was the first time they'd ever tried something at such a large scale people would talk about receiving barrels of pork that were spoiled and that would get kind of distributed to people um just not organized yeah mm. oh my gosh and that the primary journey among all of them was um, the folks that came over 1830 through 1834. And that was approximately 12,000 people in, in that journey. And then, so that removal was, was devastating to the elderly, to the children. Um, and I, I'm sure you have read even more than I have some of the accounts from the soldiers of the things that happened to the children because they just wanted to shut them up and some of them were getting sick. So they were like, they're dragging us down. I just, I think of the elderly and the children the most when I consider what they went through. It's just, it's terrible, isn't it? It's pretty horrific. And when you think about it, those are like the most kind of important people for a society, right? The older mm -hmm. generation with all of the knowledge and then the new generation um, who are going to be learning those kinds of traditional things and knowledges. Yeah, and good both, point. You, you lose both of those generations um, on the Trail of Tears. And so when you get to Indian territory, you don't have a lot of the knowledge um, that you had before. Oh. You know, I read that in the article, but that you're saying it really popped out at me this time. Um, yeah. So they didn't, they weren't able to bring that over. And then with the later removals, I hear that they were able to bring some of their Mississippi culture back to Oklahoma and kind of reteach some of those things that had been lost a little bit. Right. Yeah. So um, tell us about the clan structure and what happened because of the removal. But so the way that Choctaw society um, was organized is it's really premised on balance. And so you need to have a balance of both kinds of sides. And so um, Choctaws had Ixas, which are like the two major kinds of groups of um, Choctaws. And so you would always have to kind of marry outside of your clan, marry outside of um, your Ixa. And so each Ixa has obviously different kinds of clans. And so it's to making sure that people kind of intermarry and don't get kind of 
too isolated, you know, in their own mm-hmm. kinds of groups. And so that's the way Choctaw society was kind of organized. Um, and so there was a certain way that people were supposed to kind of do things. Um, but once you go on the Trail of Tears, you really lose kind of that because you have the knowledge of it and the people that you travel with, they might not be outside of your clan. And so um, you would have to kind of break those rules, be able to kind of survive in the new homeland. Yeah. Plus you've lost a lot of people along the journey. So you have less to choose from. Exactly. So you mentioned in the article that this would lay the groundwork for Christian churches and, and they would be kind of become the community centers later on so that they could still bring everybody together and to recover from the losses. And the Choctaw leaders worked hard to reorganize as a government so they could provide for the people. And it's been said that the Choctaws sang hymns on their way to Indian territory, whether the singing helped to keep them warm or gave them hope or comfort. I've always been moved by that thought, if that really is true. Had you heard something similar to that? Yeah, there's definitely stories of people singing hymns as they're walking the trail because, you know, they're leaving their homes that they've known. They're leaving the bones of their ancestors and the Choctaw people, our ancestors are so important to us. And so to kind of leave them behind um, is devastating. And Mm -hmm. so. And where did they leave? I mean, they can't even come back and try to visit, you know, where they left them because who knows where that was. Yeah, exactly. And so you have all this kind of real sadness about leaving the homelands and, and everything that you've ever known. And so they would sing kind of hymns that they had learned from the missionaries since, you know, missionaries had been there before um, Mm -hmm. Choctaws were removed. Um, So they go kind of over there and, you know, the Choctaw communities are pretty kind of close knit. um, And the missionaries also come over as well. And so because the missionaries um, had um, medical experience usually the communities would kind of kind of rely on them oh, so Cyrus that. Yeah. yeah so Cyrus Barrington he's kind of the big missionary that everyone knows because of his work with the Choctaw Dictionary and getting Choctaw to become a written language um, but he had a kind of like missionary circuit and so there were all these Choctaw church churches or communities that he would come visit and he would give medical aid and he would preach to them in Choctaw, of course, because he learned. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was his way of kind of getting to people. And so I think that was a really powerful way for the church to become part of Choctaw people's lives, you know, Mm -hmm. because before, Mm -hmm. if they were like kind of against it, um, they would just kind of ignore him. But now like, you know, this is the person who's bringing medical aid and giving medicine to like people who are sick and children. So they really kind of depend on him in that kind of way. And so it builds that relationship. Yeah, he truly built a relationship. He didn't, it sounds from the accounts that you and I've read is that it sounds like he doesn't, didn't come in there beating them over the head with the Bible he became part of them. He learned their language. He went over on the trail of tears with them. He and his wife. I mean, it's amazing that they, they did that as well. Um, and actually you told me earlier, something about your relative was in the same church as Cyrus Byington, right? Was it Yeah. So yes. Um, my great grandfather, Simon Billy was a preacher at Okachukma and Okachukma was one of the churches on Cyrus Byington's, um, church circuit. That's so cool. Yeah. Wow. And so um, that's in this area, this is kind of McCurtain County area, mm-hmm. which is where a lot of people speak Choctaw. Like this is kind of a stronghold for the language is the way that mm. someone's described it to me. Like you, you'll meet a lot of first language speakers coming from um, McCurtain County. And I think for me, I, <laughs> the evidence points to it being these church communities, because this is where Cyrus Barrington lived. This is where churches were um, mm. delivering sermons in Choctaw. The entire service would be in Choctaw because of Cyrus Barrington's kind of work with them. Um, and that allowed them kind of to proliferate and be really focused on the language in that way. Yeah. Well, and speaking of language and Cyrus, um, we owe him a lot for actually taking the time to write down our language and create a dictionary. I have my Choctaw language classes tonight. And I think of that sometimes I'm like, Hey, thanks Cyrus. You took the time to do that. (laughs) Yeah. We were kind of really lucky in that to have had that experience with him because 
you know, other tribes didn't have that, you know, Mm -hmm. Chickasaw is pretty close in language to Choctaw, but it is a little bit kind of different. Um, But, you know, people would force the Chickasaws to use Choctaw because they're like, oh, it's just like a dialect. So it's already written down in Choctaw. They already have their kind of like language (laughs) dictionary. So you should just use that because it's all the same. But, you know, to Chickasaw, they're like, no, it's so different. Way to muddle so, the languages. <laughs> I know. And they're like, oh, it's basically the same. And it's like, no, they're very different. And so, you know, that's a kind of touchy point for Chickasaws. <laughs> I bet. Oh my gosh. That's funny. We love our Chickasaw friends. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's only very recently that they have their kind of dictionary and kind of all of that. Oh, um, that's so, great. but we've had it for kind of a really long time and it's really great to have the language documented at that time period, because, you know, Choctaw now is so kind of different. So you can kind of trace the differences between back Mm. then and now. Yeah. And if you listen to like the Mississippi Choctaw speakers versus the Oklahoma Choctaw speakers, there's some difference in there too. There's definitely some dialect difference in there. So the 500 mile journey that took the lives of approximately one third of the Choctaws, it, it brought them where exactly in Indian territory? So Indian territory used to is technically the land of like the Caddo, the Osage, the Comanche. They all kind of um, claim it as kind of their own. It's, you know, overlapping claims mm-hmm. to the territory. You know, it's part of um, their homelands. And so the U.S. government had, you know, when they were planning this, they're like, oh, we'll just take this parcel from them and give it to the five tribes. Mm-hmm. Um and so, you know, when they first got there, it was really kind of contentious because, I you know, imagine. <laughs> they're like, we didn't consent to this. This is our <laughs> homeland. So we're going to attack you guys. Um, and so that was a major kind of issue at the, in the beginning, um, especially when you would start to go more westward. Um, uh. That's really where they would kind of meet people. Okay. Yeah. And so like their villages would get raided, their cattle would be stolen. And so, and I think that's all fair, you know? Wow. Totally. Uh, Oh my gosh. um, See, those are the accounts I've never been able to find about, I mean, why do we not hear more about that? And even all over the Indian territory, I mean, the poor Chickasaws, I mean, you do, you actually write about some of that in here. So that helps, but where do we find accounts like that? Um, so David, I think it's Levy, he wrote a book kind of um, about this particular history of really? the Western tribes and the five civilized tribes kind of coming together on the land and being like, what kind of happened? And so um, I drew a lot from his kind of account of that history. Oh, and wow. there's, you know, a few um, letters that would be like, oh, we've been raided and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's just kind of like here and there. Okay. Yeah. I just, (laughs) I, I actually, can you clear up something for me too? I once heard that the Chickasaws were placed between the Choctaw and the Comanche because the Chickasaw were more warrior type where the Choctaws were more, you know, farmers and stuff. Do you, do you know anything about that? Have you heard that too? I've never heard that. Um, but it's kind of funny because I think like the Chickasaws are kind of the real businessy type people. Oh, really? Not so much the (laughs) warrior type? Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Because, you know, when they were being removed, like they had a lot of kind of enterprising um, strategies for how to kind of um, uh, pay for their removal. You know, they, they sold all their, so they had their lands and they sold it for money that they then used to pay for their kind of removal and to like start their own society. So to me, Chickasaws are a little bit, um, they're kind of like the Choctaw. Then. Yeah, yeah. And they're very similar. Um, but they, they definitely did kind of when they negotiated um, where they were going to have their lands within Choctaw Nation, mm-hmm. they were definitely put in the West and served as a buffer between um, Choctaw Nation and those Western tribes um, wow, who I- would raid because, you know, the Chickasaws actually in the um, records of you they that that was a major point of contention for them being like oh. we are constantly be, be, being kind of raided and no one's really doing anything the u.s government needs to build a fort out here and so eventually they do do that um but that was a big major kind of issue <laughs> that they had definitely early on i know it's not funny but it's just like it's just so ironic and so so tone deaf for lack of a better word for the people who 
did this, I mean, it's like, oh, no problem. We're just going to move them over to this area that no one ever wants to farm or live in because it's too hot and there's tornadoes and spiders and snakes. And, and then they just throw them in there. I know that they did divide it up by here's the Chickasaw land, here's the Tonkawa, whatever it was, but oh my gosh, how insane would that be to be living either next to someone you used to war with or living in the territory of a warring tribe or people that, you know, are typically more aggressive tribes and that kind of thing. It's just, God bless them. Oh, I can't even imagine, but I definitely want to check out that book you mentioned because that has to be interesting. I'm sure my listeners will check it out too. Yeah. I think it also really demonstrates how poorly the U S government kind of had planned for this, you know, like they had no clear kind of title, no different particular kinds of claims and Mm -hmm. the way it also speaks to the way that they kind of think all tribes are the same, right? but you know, each of them have very strong histories that they carry with them. You know, Choctaws and Chickasaws didn't get along for a long time in the homelands, you know, Mm -hmm. the Chickasaws primarily allied with the British and Choctaws with the French and that caused a lot of clashes. And so those kinds of histories do carry over a little bit. And so (laughs) you have to kind of remember all of that. And it's crazy that they put all these people in these places and not expect trouble to happen. So (laughs) it's really such a blundering by the U S government. It really is. And, and if they did know, if they did realize what was supposed to happen, that's even worse. Cause they're like, Oh, let them kill each other. You know? Yeah. And I'm sure that was some thinking of some general out there. Definitely. Right. Right. Oh, so sad. They just, they did not see them as humans and they could have learned so much from them and continued, um, you know, both parties, if they really were going to invade the U S they could have figured it out somehow, I assume, but probably just better not to invade the U S. Um, (laughs) I once read that when natives were moved, if the terrain and environment wasn't similar to their original homelands, they would try to migrate elsewhere to lands that belonged to someone else, like an existing tribe or a tribe that had been moved there. And the government would have to come in and corral them back to their allotted areas. Um, so it, a, have you heard the same thing? Is that true? And then how did the environment in Southeast Oklahoma compare to their Mississippi homelands? Um, I don't think I've heard kind of that, but I can kind of seeing it play out, mm-hmm. you know, um, the territory that Choctaws gained, um, from their treaty, it is, it's, and if you've been to Oklahoma, you can, you know, it's very different. Yes. Like Eastern Oklahoma <laughs> looks so different from Central East or Central West Oklahoma, you know, mm-hmm. within Choctaw Nation. It's such lush and beautiful forest in Eastern Oklahoma. Oh, the rolling hills. It's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, that's the Oklahoma I grew up with. And so um, when I w- would hear things about tumbleweeds, I'd be like, what? I don't, I don't know about tumbleweeds. <laughs> Where's that? I, yeah, I was like, I know about mountains and forests and dense um, trees. Uh-huh, right, <laughs> um, right. And so I think that kind of portion of Oklahoma is pretty similar to Mississippi in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the further west you get, it starts to be a lot more different. But of course, I have, I, I say this because I've seen pictures of Mississippi, but I've actually never been. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, and, and um, I've only been one time but from what I understand, wasn't it kind of like very humid, marshy, they used reeds, um, like cane. Yeah. You have river, like river cane. Yeah. River yeah. cane. And so, in fact, I think it's funny because I remember being on, um, I don't, it, it's not the same Facebook group that you're about to talk about later, but there was some kind of textiles, native textiles group I was on, on Facebook. And, and this lady was on there asking, Hey, do you know what the regalia or what, what people wore every day as Choctaws back in the day. And someone was like, well, how far back are you talking? She was like, well, you know, like the Comanche had those beautiful buckskin dresses and all those things. And, and they were like, oh no, we wore more like a prairie dress, like the dresses you and I were talking about that have the diamond pattern on them. And they were like, no, 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 I don't, I don't like that. I'm thinking more like, wasn't there deer skin? And they were like, oh yeah, I'll show you what that looked like the original. And it's like this picture of a woman with no top on and a deerskin like skirt <laughs> from a gal from Mississippi. I mean, it was a drawing, but, and then she was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I won't be wearing that <laughs> or not wearing that. I don't know. So, um, they had to stay cool out there. So 
the women sometimes were not wearing shirts, but so, yeah, they also have different kinds of, you know, sets of values about like what people should be wearing. You know, I think that comes from like a very kind of Western idea of modesty that doesn't exist back then for Choctaws. And so that was something that they learned much later on. And so it's a part of kind of thinking differently about the things from Western society that we've kind of internalized as important or like, these are what we value. Um, But for our Choctaw ancestors, it was totally different and they kind of did things their own way. And they had a reason for why they did that. Right. Right. Can you imagine? They're like, my boobs are for feeding babies. I didn't realize I was supposed to cover them up. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. It makes more sense to have them just chilling there. Just ready. Yeah. 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 On the the go. (laughs) Why do I have to deal with this dress in this so in this way? Yeah, exactly. But I will say this is going to sound so terrible, but I am kind of jealous of the Comanche and their buckskin dresses. They're so beautiful, and you know they could paint them and and put belts on them and that kind of thing. I like our prairie dresses, but I do tend to like the Comanche dresses um, or the well, there is Indians dresses. The whole other world of like pre-colonial Choctaw clothing that we don't, I wish we knew more about, but you know, we're trying to work towards that and figure, yeah. learn more about that and learn about the materials and kind of all of that stuff. Well, that's a good commercial so. for what you're going to talk about later with your <laughs> um, textiles group. So, <laughs> so once the Choctaw were in their new home, the next step was adaptation. So tell us more about that. Um, yeah, so Choctaws had to, you know, start a new society. They had to build schools, they had to build farms, they had to build homes, government offices, and kind of all of that stuff. And so that starts to happen in this time period. So when Choctaws secured their new kind of homelands, they were completely sovereign over it. And so that in- included being able to dictate who could live there. And so they only wanted Choctaws to live there or um, citizens basically. Mm -hmm. And so that means they could keep out Americans because this was their homeland and no one else was supposed to live there except people that they wanted there. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't want intruders. And so they were allowed to kind of keep all of those people out. Um, But over time we start to see more and more people kind of finding a way into Indian territory and Choctaw territory. Yeah. That push for let us in. We we have this whole entire big, huge land mass, but we want to come into the one place that (laughs) you guys have been placed (laughs) Yeah, for some reason. And like you said, Oklahoma is so beautiful in so many areas, but there are some really God forsaken places in Oklahoma that are really hard to to grow anything. It's, it's really sandy dirt or that's that red clay dirt. And, um, you know, the, the Southeast part of Oklahoma, I think the Choctaw's got the best place, but, um, yeah, that's, I don't know why they had to invade that one little space in this whole country, but okay. So the, the Choctaw come over and it's time to start figuring out how they're going to govern. So what did that look like? So back in the homelands, I think we, a lot of us think of Choctaw Nation as kind of a singular government because that's the way that it is now. Mm -hmm. But back then they were really kind of divided and it was like a loose um, associations with each other. So it's much more like a kind of confederacy. And so there was different groups of Choctaws and they did things a certain way and they were very kind of distinct. And so they were kind of loosely brought together from political alliances, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that was carried over to the new homelands. And so we kind of replicated this district system, which we kind of had before. And so that gives us the three districts that are that we find in Indian territory. And then those are named after the prominent Choctaw leaders, Mashulatubi, Apokshinobi, and Pushmataha. Great. And then, and then what else did they do to, you know, start really solidifying this new government? Yeah. And so each of those districts had kind of their own sets of governments. And so um, they're kind of um, led by one kind of Minko who was kind of in charge. And then you have um, smaller kinds of chiefs or (laughs) people in charge. And so um, they start to develop a kind of Euro-American system in which um, they're united with one another. Hmm. Wow. And then we know that the non-natives 
for many years, there was this history of them giving the natives, um, strong drink <laughs> and it caused a lot of problems. And so what I think is interesting that you mention in the article is how, what the very first law they passed in the general council in 1834 was about the whiskey, right? So whiskey was a major problem in the negotiations for the removal treaty, right? Mm -hmm. um, U.S. officials would kind of give leaders whiskey to like bring down their defenses and cause them to um, rack up immense debts that they would try to have the debts um, traded for land. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Choctaw leaders kind of saw that happen. They're like, we don't want that to happen again, you know? And that's kind of why they do the entire Choctaw nation is um, collectively owned. So no individual kind of chief can give away land because of his drinking debts or that kind oh, of stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, and so that was kind of a ma major kind of concern. And so they didn't want that kind of happening um, in the new homeland. And so they, their general council kind of, um, which was made up of representatives elected from the different districts, um, they kind of all collectively decided against um, the sale of whiskey. Sounds like they were starting it out right. So <laughs> yeah, they were like, we, they, we learned a lot from that experience. So we're going to put up a lot of like safety yes. walls against the same thing happening. Yeah, fresh start. So probably no surprise to anyone, the U.S. had already broken treaty after treaty and forced the Choctaw to move to Indian territory. And then they continued to break more treaties. So tell us more about that. Choctaws had secured their kind of lands, but now they're trying, the U.S. government is also trying to get, move the Chickasaws over. And so originally um, they had suggested, oh, why don't you move in with the Choctaws because their land is so kind of big and they were starting to run out of land um, to put mm. one of any of the removed tribes because this was after the Cherokees and the Creeks and the Seminoles had kind of received their kinds of areas where they were going to live and the Chickasaws were like really kind of picky with where they were going to live and they originally <laughs> turned down um living in the lands that the Choctaws had really given, you know the history that they had and they were trying to thinking they were thinking of going into Mexico which is like Texas but mm -hmm. back okay. then was considered part of yeah. Mexico and so they're like oh maybe we go there and they're like no no, no that's not going to work and so, you know, Choctaws <laughs> were always supposed to have that parcel of land, but then the U.S. government kind of came along with like, these people need land too. You should just like all live together and they'll pay you for it and kind of all of that stuff. And so that is a kind of clear violation of that kind of original treaty. Um, and so then it gets kind of mod um, modulated to provide um, a portion of the land for the Chickasaws. Oh, but, you boy. know, it was always supposed to be just for Choctaws. And I think that's interesting because um, as the story progresses in your article, it, it sounds like the Choctaws were actually being pretty hospitable. It's not like they loved it, but they were like, okay, yeah, come on over. We'll share our land with you. It, am I wrong about that? I think it kind of comes off that way, but it, um, I haven't seen enough kind of records to give me a kind of sense mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. but I thought they were pretty generous, you know? <laughs> um, for giving a large kind of portion of their land and they were kind of um, paid. And, you know, the thing is that they were like, the Chickasaws are not their own nation. They're gonna be part of Choctaw Nation. Mm -hmm. And the article will later show how that becomes very contentious and how it's not kind of, doesn't really work out in the end. Mm -hmm. um, but they were like, you can live here and you'll be part of our government, but like, you can't be kind of autonomous. And so yeah, they wow. really dictated that kind of term, but wow. which obviously kind of goes haywire later on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, as you can only imagine, there's a lot of drama going on there. Um, <laughs> always, always so much drama. <laughs> so much. And that's why, again, I'm surprised there's not more movies about all of this, but so I think it's interesting too, that president Andrew Jackson sent out some Indian agents to try to convince the Choctaws to sell 4,500,000 acres of the new, you know, land that was in Indian territory that belonged to them. They're like, they just, you know, it, this was in September of 1831. So it was before 
maybe it was before the Choctaw had been there, begun their journey, but either way, it's like, that's early on. It's like, okay, we're giving you this land. Oh, by the way, can you sell 4.5 million to the Chickasaws? Thanks. But that negotiation failed. I mean, obviously, but it's kind of crazy again. What, what are these people thinking? <laughs> so I, I thought it was also interesting that there's this provision that's still in effect today when it comes to issues over land and water, when it comes to the Chickasaw and Choctaw, right? Can you talk more about that? The placement of Chickasaws in Choctaw territory really kind of brings them together and in a really significant kinds of ways. And so this is later kind of enshrined in the 1855 treaty, but they eventually make it so Choctaws and Chickasaws own the land collectively. And so they have, um, Chickasaws have like a one fourth interest in the land and the Choctaws have a three fourths interest, which is kind of based off um, the population sizes. Um, so that kind of really solidifies them today. So when there's any kind of lawsuits or anything kind of really pertaining to Choctaw land, the Chickasaws have to be kind of a part of it because of the treaty that kind of unites them together. Oh, so that's wow. a kind of thing that carries over into the present. So sometimes people don't know that. And so yeah. the required you know, with the water settlement that they had, it's the Choctaw Chickasaw water settlement and it's because it's about the land. And oh. so that's kind of why they are a part of that. So I was trying to help people understand kind of that contemporary um, part of our history. That's interesting because again, I knew nothing about the, the land and water thing and that the Chickasaw and the Choctaw are still to this day tied together so much. I never hear anything about it. I must not be looking in the right places. I look more on history than I do, um, than I do looking up current events, but that's just nuts. Wow. Yeah. And that, and I think that's also a major part of why I did this series. Cause there are so many weird things kind of yeah. like that, that exist today. And there's these strange legal arrangements and they're so deeply rooted in these, um, this time period of history that we haven't kind of studied or know as much about as that I would like us to kind of know, you know, yeah, I would hear, right. um, I think someone emailed me after I had published I think one of these articles about the Choctaws and Chickasaws and they're like, I never knew why um, Choctaws live in Chickasaw um, land and I learned and now I can kind of see why we have so many Choctaws and Chickasaws or why there's such a like strong bond between mm -hmm. them as mm -hmm. a kind of people. And they're like, I was never, I was always really nervous about asking people about that, but now yeah. it kind of clears it up for me. And so I wanted to use this as a way for people to kind of make sense of their lives in a way and show yeah. how it's like rooted in these histories. I love that you passed that on. Thank you for doing that for all of us. Again, these podcasts actually help me learn as well. So <laughs> this is really helpful. And I mean, when you're saying that, I, I think we may have talked about this the other day, but my, um, some of the land allotments from my family on my dad's side are that are still in our family are in McLean County in Oklahoma near Wayne or in Wayne, Oklahoma. And I always thought that was weird because on our documents that we have, you know, everything says Chickasaw on it and we're clearly Choctaw. So, um, maybe that's part of it too. Right. I mean, is that a possibility that that was, um, um, they gave Choctaw land or Chickasaw land to some Choctaws in that area? Yeah, absolutely. So that definitely happened to a lot of people who are, mm. people would live in um, Choctaw territory and they would receive allotments in Chickasaw territory because like um, that's kind of just what they were assigned. And so because okay. to the U.S., you know, the DOS Commission, when they were kind of handing out those kinds of allotments, they're like, oh, this is all kind of the same. And so they, they did try to keep them within, but like, you know, they would run out of land in that area. And so they're like, okay just give them this land over here. And it might be totally right. <laughs> different than where they have um, their homestead allotment, but their surplus allotment is kind of elsewhere. Right. <laughs> Again, it's fine. It's fine. They're just <laughs> Indians. They'll be okay. Oh God. Um, <laughs> so the Chickasaws also, I think you mentioned this earlier, were the last of the five tribes to leave their homeland in the East for Indian territory. So that ends your February article, which kind of left me on a cliffhanger because it was like, okay, the Chickasaws and the Choctaws have come together. What the hell is going to happen next? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you start off in the March article that the two tribes got together and were working on a constitution. Tell us more about that. 
Yeah, since the Chickasaws were now going to be a part of Choctaw Nation, they had to obviously write a new constitution to adjust for this new group of people. And so that we have the creation of the Chickasaw District alongside the three Choctaw districts. And so they're trying to figure out a way to kind of have a government with two people and how to kind of manage all of that. And so that's really enshrined in that um, 1837 constitution. Mm. And I think you have a theory for what the government had planned with this whole action, because otherwise it's like so weird. It's all strange. What do, what do you think that that whole reasoning was? Basically, the U.S. government was, you know, they thought Choctaws and Chickasaws, they have a similar language, similar history. They're all basically the kind of same. And <laughs> they thought it would be perfectly fine to kind of just throw these people together, forgetting that they, Jeez. the people themselves remembered the histories between them yeah. and all of that. And obviously that does not go according to the U.S. government's plan. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. And so you have a lot of strain between the Choctaws and the Chickasaws. Um, the Chickasaws, um, because they were much smaller, mm-hmm. they, um, they had less representation in the kind of government. And so they were their own district. And so they had the three other districts. And so they would, if they wanted something to happen a certain way, they would get outvoted by the three. And so they felt like they were very oh. oppressed. Oh, um, that's by so the Choctaws. Yeah, yeah. We're it's, so sorry, Chickasaw. <laughs> yeah, so, th- and I think this is maybe what um, the lady who had kind of sent me an email being like, uh, was perhaps alluding to, like, oh. there, I, and I never really kind of got this sentiment until like I interviewed um, someone from Chickasaw Nation for my um, Chata Tusholi mm-hmm. speaker series, but I never really got like the Chickasaw kind of side of things. Yeah. And I was writing this series, I think I think these um, these particular decades around the same time that I had done the interview with her. And so she really gave me the perspective of like the Chickasaw experience of living within Choctaw Nation. And I was like, oh, you know, for me, I was like, oh, those Chickasaws, like they're just always complaining. Right. <laughs> but then right. it made it so like kind of real. Yeah. And I could like see her like kind of very like um, reaction to it. And it was so like, I felt it through the kind of screen. And so <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and it, oh, Lordy. <laughs> I was like, oh man, okay, this is like really yeah. serious to them. And so like to me, because I was like, oh, but there's all these other things going on. And so I was so focused on kind of, you know, the, the different things going on in Choctaw history. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about that. And so that, that's a good so point this, though. Yeah. I, I mean, we all have to step back sometimes and go, oh, I didn't have their perspective. So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And so that was a big lesson for me, you know, like, even though I knew I was doing indigenous kinds of history, it really reminded me that you have to be kind of really attentive to all the different kinds of groups and pay attention to those specificities. Because like, I was telling an indigenous history, but it was a very Choctaw history. And so Mm. I had to like, listen to all of the other stuff. So even the experts do that on occasion, you know, even the experts need a reminder every now and then that, um, you know, there's the human side or there's different perspectives in there. And yeah, that's so interesting, Megan. Yes. So, you know, I'm, I'm still a student. I still kind of make mistakes as well. So oh, don't think like I'm like perfect or anything, like just, we're that. all still kind of learning. And so, yes, we are. I, I really value those experiences. Likewise, likewise, learn, learning so much as we go. And so there was this Choctaw leader named Peter Pitchlin. Tell us a little bit about him and, and what his role was in some of these things that were going on. So Peter Pitchlin, he was the son of John Pitchlin, who was a white interpreter for Choctaws and he had a Choctaw mother. And so he grew up learning um, English and knew a lot about American kind of society, but he also knew about Choctaw society as well. So he was like this kind of intermediary um, between those kinds of societies. And so he got an education and he um, really quickly became a powerful kind of Choctaw leader because he knew how he learned English and he knew how to kind of negotiate and he was really smart. And so he did a lot of, he started, had a career in kind of Choctaw politics. And so he was always really involved. And so he, um, you know, managed Choctaw Academy um, when it was in operation. So Choctaw Academy mm-hmm. is a Choctaw run boarding school 
it was federally funded, but it was kind of directed by Choctaws. Yeah. Run by the Choctaws. Okay. Mm -hmm, Which which is very different than some of those other experiences. Yeah. You know, and so they really directed the kind of curriculum and what kids were going to learn. So they had like very kind of classical educations, um, just like you would find in colleges across the United States at that time, time period. So mm-hmm. they were like reading Plato and Socrates and kind of all of that stuff. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. So Peter Fitchlin um, attended there and then he later kind of managed the school, but he was always involved in Choctaw politics. He would um, serve as a delegate um, mm-hmm. for the between general council and he lived in Washington, D.C. And so he kind of was like a lobbyist mm-hmm. kind of and making sure people understood what Choctaws wanted and needed and was their kind of person um, on the inside. In DC. I just wonder, um, you know, what was it like for him to live in DC? I'm sure there weren't many of his fellow natives living there, maybe from each tribe or something, but, um, you know, it was a time when they were looked so down on and here he was an educated man. He knew how to negotiate. He had, he was living between both worlds. Gosh, I mean, like, what would it be like to be him back then? Yeah, he, he really kind of negotiated that kind of fine line going back and forth. Um, I think it's Mark Twain who like met Peter Pitchlin on a boat or something. And he was so struck by Peter Pitchlin, so impressed was like with his kind of career. Wow. And Peter Pitchlin was always like would tell people about how he'd met Mark Twain. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I met Mark Twain. Forget about mm-hmm. the fact that I'm negotiating in DC, but I met Mark Twain. <laughs> Um, Pitchlin also served as a chief during the Civil War, mm. and so um, he kind of handled all of that, um, and then he would go back to living and working in Washington. You know, he had a law training, and so he knew a lot about negotiating kinds of treaties or making sure the United States, like, actually fulfilled its treaty obligations. And so that was primarily his job when he was in Washington being like, you promised this, you need to do this Mm -hmm. and kind of really holding them accountable. Yeah. So the government did another removal in 1845, correct? Yeah. 1844 to 1845, I think it was. Um, So that brought a a few more Mississippi Choctaws over, um, but there was also a later removal um, around the time of allotment. So around 1901, 1902, um, you have Choctaws coming over to Indian territory so they can receive allotments. So they had to be added to kind of roles and they had to actually go to Indian territory in order to receive allotments. And so you have a bunch of people kind of coming over so they can get that land. Wow. And I think we're going to cover some more about the allotments later because I have some questions for you about that too. Um, And you mentioned in the beginning, there's a misconception about how well the Choctaw actually did. So after Choctaws started their own kind of society, they, they went into the same kinds of farming that they had in Mississippi. So there was lots of Choctaw businessmen who knew how to run plantation kinds of economies and they definitely brought that over to Indian territory and kind of restarted that um, when they came over after the Trail of Tears and so you'll so the Red River kind of area in southern Choctaw territory was very fertile and so they would grow cotton and they had slaves in which they would that would um, take care of these kinds of crops and um, it was really a booming kind of business for them and so Dokesville is that kind of the the capital the capital changes multiple kinds of times yeah it years. does doesn't it <laughs> yeah they go they go back and they move it around I think depending who is chief and like where they lived and they're like yeah oh, we need I don't want to live capital. there <laughs> yeah yeah so Dokesville was a capital for a long time because it's very kind of prosperous and it doesn't really exist um that much now you don't really like, hear that okay. much about the well, you know like yeah Dokesville isn't a town um, for Choctaws now, you know, oh, like okay. it's kind of yeah. like a historical place, but people don't really kind of live there anymore. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, okay. But you know, Dokesville was like booming and there was always kind of stuff going on there. And so that kind of, um, was an epicenter of trade. And so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had, there's a lot of Dokesville names on my family's records. I guess they went there a lot and it's crazy to think that now it's an, it's nothing or, you know, it's, it's dwindled. Um, we're back in the day it used to be a big trading center. 
the Choctaw were known for their good business sense, political success, farming, and that, again, desire for education. Tell us more about that. So in 1842, General Council passed an act regarding public schools, which is which kind of really started to establish its boarding school system. Um, and this was a schooling system that Choctaws kind of directed themselves. It was they wanted their children to be educated. That was something Choctaw parents would go to council being like, I want a school in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You need to build a school <laughs> in our neighborhood. And they were kind of always hounding general council for, really? um, yeah, for, to have the schools kind of built. And so they really kind of started with a kind of boarding school system, you know, because Choctaw Nation was so big and they couldn't build a school in every community. And so a boarding school was like kind of the centralized location in which kids could go and learn um, and get the kind of education that they wanted their kids to have. That's it for part one, y'all. I hope you'll stay tuned for part two is really good. You're going to love it. And thank you so much for taking time to listen to Megan talk about the great work that she has done for the research on our Choctaw people and all the good stuff she brings to the table. I'm interested in it. I've had so much fun doing this. I hope you've loved it too. Thanks again, y'all. Have a great rest of your day. The Choctaw Nation has always provided a foundation upon which a future can be built. From our home in Southeast Oklahoma to a bingo hall that grew to be one of the largest casinos in the world. Today, summer school programs lay the groundwork for a love of learning. Small business programs support local economies. And with over 10,000 jobs created, Choctaw offers financial stability to tribal members and our neighbors. Together, we build success. Because together, we're more. Thanks for listening to Native Choc Talk. Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Choc Talk. That's Native, C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechoctalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>